Good evening, everybody. I'm Dave Dressler. Thank you for sticking around and uh, checking out our evening uh, show tonight. We, we were starting out with a, a, a big name in the industry, a good friend of mine. Uh, how many of you don't know who Rick Tumlinson is? Well, we got... <laughs> there's, there's a couple over there. <laughs> so Rick has done so many innovative things in terms of space. He was uh, the one who uh, worked with a group to privatize the Mir Space Station, and they were almost successful with that, but NASA had other ideas. Uh, Rick uh, started the Space Frontier Foundation with a, a group of people, also Deep Space Industries, and uh, what Rick is currently working on, there's these postcards on your seat, and everybody think long and hard about this. Austin, Texas is a fabulous town, good entertainment, good times, and they have the coolest space conference of, of any place in the world, right there in Austin. <laughs> Except, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> good point, thank you, Rick. So without any more. Sitting right there, man. <laughs> well, this one is super cool. But, uh, you know, especially when we, get, when we get Bob at this one, then it's even... <laughs> oh, Bob is coming. Yeah, so there you go. They're both super cool. And, uh, yeah, I hope to see you all in Austin, Texas. But right now, we're, we've got some uh, very interesting things to learn from. I consider him our spiritual leader for going to space. Rick Tomlinson, thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the revolution. So, um, yeah, we're going to have some fun tonight because, well, first of all, I haven't seen my presentation. And, um, like, I was editing it until five minutes ago. It is a new thing I'm playing with. I'm kind of humbly suggesting this to you guys. I'm going to kind of push on it and see if we can find some traction with it over time. Um, there are way more words in this presentation than I usually like. So we're going to be using words. Some of them have meaning. Um, and uh, so first of all, oh, you know, it was funny because I was working on this earlier and I was thinking, uh, I was thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if, like, if Lincoln was alive today, right? And he's getting ready to go to like Gettysburg and he's just wanting to make sure that the fonts are good in his PowerPoint. <laughs> all right, so let's see what we can do here. Hopefully this thing works. There we are. Um, oh, I can't see my, yeah, they're right here, okay. I already, I got some vodka. No, I don't, I don't drink. I don't drink. It's water. It's water. I used to drink real good. All right, so uh, this is my new company, Star Century Partners. Um, you're going to hear some stuff about us in the fall. We're doing a, uh, we're a venture capital firm. I'm cashing in on the scars from being a startup guy. Uh, and now I have the pleasure of going out and trying to raise $50 million to fund uh, what we call frontier enabling technology companies. I'm not allowed to advertise, but if anybody wants to talk to me later and you're an accredited investor. Um, Earthlight New Worlds are the two organizations, nonprofit that I work with. Um, Earthlight is sort of the overview of, let's call it the spiritual place, where you can come and talk about um, how you feel of, about opening the universe. You can bring your whatever you're into, if you're an artist, if you're a cook, if you're whatever, you can come work with us in Earth, uh, Earthlight. New Worlds is working uh, on a space development matrix, which we hope will be a living, interactive database of people around the world who are working on the various technologies needed to develop space habitats. Um, so it's a very different type of thing. Um, we have uh, conferences in Austin, as was just mentioned. Uh, this is our one this fall. They're very different than most space conferences. We like to bring a culture, art, music, um, kind of, we have a sitar player who's gonna open us up this year. It's gonna be awesome. Get your chakras aligned and all of this. We have 500 kids in the room next door on the first day. Um, you might recognize the guy arguing with the general there. He's the pilot of the Rosinante. Uh, so we have some very interesting guests. Uh, we have a space business plan competition. We call it Sharks in Space. And then, to, cra to cap it all off, we have the Space Cowboy Ball, which is a costume party that starts with the question, what would you wear to a formal party on Mars in 100 years? <laughs> and it's aimed outside of our conference, unlike most conference banquets. This is aimed into the, into the community, and it gets wild. And 
One of the proudest accomplishments, I'm a big, huge space guy. I love the frontier. I love the future and everything, but my proudest accomplishment is that we kept the dance floor packed for two and a half hours. So welcome to the revolution, as I said. Now, we're going to go into this. I'm going to talk about a few ideas. I'm going to lay out a couple of things for you. I just want to see how you, uh, what you think about it. Now, look, the future is not going to remember this. The big future, the grand thousand-year future, they're not going to care, okay? They're not going to care any more than we care about what graffiti was left on the pillars by the Herculaneum back in a certain period of time a few thousand years ago. But they're going to remember whether or not we were able to get them across the bridge into the future. So that's what we're going to talk about here, is the Declaration of Human Rights in the universe. I do have a question for you. Um, a couple of hands. Uh, why do you want to go to Mars? Somebody? Anybody? Give me a thought. Go ahead. Necessary. Necessary? Discover that we're not alone in respect for life. Discover Mars what that like. We'll go there. Somebody down here, yes. Yes, ma'am. And sir. Good, these are all interesting. Nobody said to live. Wow, okay. One at the back, go ahead. Which infers living, so I like that one. So it's coming, right? We, we want it to come. We're working really hard to make it come. I call, by the way, the, the uh, interestingly named BFR, what I call the big fracking rocket. Thank God for Battlestar Galactica. Um, I, believe, I call these Mayflower class. 50 to 100 people, Mayflower class ships. Um, now, this is a little bit about my heritage because it informed. I grew up on science fiction and my family's history. We were part of the first 300 in Texas. My family co-founded the Texas Rangers. My uh, great, great, great actually signed for the cannon that is in the picture and that flag that led to the start of the Texas Revolution, right? So we're kind of like thick in the middle of this. And so I went to the reenactment. They let me hang out, which was kind of cool. But oh, and one of my uh, great greats died in the Alamo, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a whole frontier thing going on. I also happen to be a tree hugger. So this just confuses the hell out of people. This is why I live in Austin, by the way. Now, we've been engaged in this battle for a long time. It's been a long revolution. Bob, all of, many of the people in this room have been fighting this revolution a long time. That was the first ever commercial rocket that was Matagorda Island, Texas. Uh, Deke Slayton, some of the guys worked on that. Uh, this was an article that came out a uh, year, two years ago, about how we won the space revolution, which is interesting to me because we haven't. That's one of the reasons I'm going to talk about what I'm going to talk about. We haven't won yet. I mean, I love the article, I thank you, Space News, but no, we aren't done yet. We haven't won. So I have three, uh, three keys to the frontier. I will always recite these. We have to have regular, reliable, low-cost access to and from space, number one. Number two, we have to have the ability to use the resources of space for whatever we want to do whatever we want. And number three, we need governments to support the idea of an open frontier in space by, of, and for the people or then stay the hell out of the way. So we've got the rocket thing happening. We got Jeff, we got Elon. We need more because we can't count on two because like if they both screw up and the SEC throws them both in jail, then we're dead. So we need more of you guys out there doing this stuff. But we need to understand that that is actually something that's really starting to get done. We have reusability coming in. Now we've started to get some of the ideas in place in 2015, I was very honored to be able to throw a summit in Washington. Uh, we had 100 people, uh, and we got, a, we got 99 of them. One of them was a consultant. She was afraid to piss off her, her client in the room. But um, to agree that the word settlement should be included in what they call the NASA Act, the act that is renewed every year to give NASA its funding. Last year, activists of different organizations working together were able to get that word settlement all the way to the end of the process. It was the House Senate... Um, Joint committee, when they come together, after it's gone all the way through, they go to a committee, they sign off on it, and one staffer from one congressman took the word settlement out. That's how close we got. Now, this is one of the points I'm trying to make. Top principles are critical. Fighting about what rocket, fighting about what destination, et cetera, et cetera. No. We want them all. 
But we have to talk about top level principles because that informs everything else in the hierarchy of ideas and action in our society. Top principles. We have to get the word settlement into the vernacular. They're using it. They're starting to use it. It used to be called the S word. Now you start hearing it, senators are saying it, but they're still trying to take it out. We're gonna get it back in there. We had the Commercial Space Launch Act of 2015. These all came out of the beginnings of these conversations. We were thrilled by this. This gets into the idea of space resource utilization. We're seeing these different legislative initiatives around the world. By the way, quick side note, uh, I've got to watch the side notes because we've only got 25 minutes. But what's really interesting is because we didn't put the word settlement in to the NASA Act a couple of years ago, which would have gone into a funded activity in the name of settling space. And then shortly after, the head of the United Arab Emirates came out and announced that his nation is going to build a colony on Mars. In the grand great view of history, looking back a thousand years, people will say the first nation on Earth to declare it was gonna settle space was not the United States, but the United Arab Emirates, because we took the word out. Now, there are things that are gonna happen that are gonna try and stop you. There are people out there that don't want us to do what we want to do. This is a very interesting, uh, the conversation is a website where scientists uh, and these kinds of people with doctor in the first name and things like that, they have debates and discussions. And there was this article that came out, I think, and they actually had it on Spacecom at one point. And it referred to the idea that like, hey, we, sh we shouldn't go to Mars now because you know they discovered a, a, a puddle of water under the uh, ice cap and it may have life in there, which is awesome, but now we, we shouldn't go. You know, and it doesn't help when you have Elon running around talking about nuking Mars and stuff. But, oh, shut up, Elon. <laughs> but there are people out there that don't want you to go. The Russians are actually, now they're starting to shift. And as, few as, they get a, as soon as they get a few more oligarchs involved and in wanting to go into space, they'll shut up about it. But right now, they're still like, well, you know, all the cool stuff is happening in America. Therefore, we hate it. Therefore, we have to ban it. So they were in Vienna recently this spring. I work a lot with the UN type people. And, they were trying to get some language in to basically stop private activities beyond the scope of international government relationships in space. We're locked in. We don't know it yet. Why? Because we're all sitting around here talking to each other. We're not talking to them. But what's, here's what's interesting. And this is where I want to go with this. All of the regulations, the rules, the debates, the discussions, everything that's going on out there is taking place in the realm of nations. Nations. Now, some people are starting to talk about commercial space because that's cool. And I'm really thrilled about that. I spent 25 years trying to make it cool. So we're starting to talk about commercial space companies. And we're talking about nations. Now, this is the probably most important sentence on the planet, historically and presently, regarding human activities in space. Whether you like it or not, probably the most important one. And what's interesting is it talks about national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, use or occupation or other means, by nations. I wanna leap over that. I think it's time to start getting ahead of that game. I think that this period of nations, by the way, the Outer Space Treaty did a good job initially for the first few couple of decades it was around. It stopped war through space and it stopped the two superpowers from creating um, hegemony in, in the solar system. It worked for a while. It's not working right now because there's a lot of little things flying around up there. I, I could just see like the American and Chinese versions of graffiti on each other's satellites saying, you know, I was here. The XB-37 kind of floating up there and a little arm comes out. So, I mean, this, this is the kind of stuff that's going on and we've got our Nihon. Sorry. And we have these different things going on, you know, that, that are all nations. It's all about countries. So I'm going to suggest to you the idea that maybe we just start making it about people. That it's about people. Because none of these treaties actually talk about people. It's national sovereignty. You know, it's about conquering in the name of countries and things like that. Let's make it about people. By the way, these are three of the 500 kids that come to our conference. I just 
love that shot. Gets me chugged up. If we make it about people, make it about the idea that you, as a human being, should be allowed to go out into the universe and realize your potential. Now, look, here's an interesting thing. This is the Homestead Act, right? And see, one of the interesting things, when you look at history, the idea that you could go out to a place and have a piece of land is really one of the greatest motivators. In this case, it was 160 acres. But here's the problem with this in the name of what we're trying to do. In order to give us that land as American citizens, the United States government would have to be asserting its right as a nation that it owned that land in order to be able to give it to us. And you're back into the national issues. So unless all of the countries on the planet recognize the right of somebody, think about the fights that are going to get into that, who can give you that land legally, which means that that country has been ceded the authority or ownership over that piece of territory, all hell is going to break loose. So we have to take it out of the realm of nations. Change the conversation. I love this one. Talk about an early version of the conversation. 160 AD. The property of no one become the property of the first occupant. Very clean. Now, I'm sure in terms of Romans, they were looking at the person being anybody who wasn't like a Frank or a, you know, a Celt or whatever. Those were people. But we're not going to be stealing this away from the little moon people or the Martians with any luck. And here's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everybody has the right to own property. Alone or in association with others. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his or her property. That is a UN declaration. Let's use it. So here is my statement. I just made this up. This is my submission to you as a community. There are a few clauses to this. So I'm going to read through it, and I'll break them down a little bit, and then we'll, we'll be done. I believe that it is the inalienable right of all human beings to go any place in the universe to do anything they choose to do, to use any resources they may find, to own the land or space on or within which they live, and to establish homes, enterprises, and communities that are free to be governed by the inhabitants and citizens therein in any manner they see fit within the parameters set forth in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, so long as they do not harm or threaten the earth, its life, and people, harm nor interfere with any other human beings, their property, sacred or venerated places, or harm the ecosystems, I'll come back to that one, Bob, property, sacred, or venerated spaces of any other living creatures. This is my, my humble submission to the world of saying, let's work on this. Let's make that a declaration that we all carry, or a version of it after people work on it or whatever, and say that's what we believe in, because that's what I believe in. Far more than I believe in nation states, far more than I believe in any of the other institutions on the planet. I believe in human beings working together in communities to be able to do whatever they want to do. And by the way, if you're paying attention to the new generations that are coming up on the planet right now, peer to peer, this is them. This is how they think. So let's look at the, a couple of breakdowns here in it. So long as so, in so doing, they do not harm nor threaten the earth, its life, and people. In other words, don't use space to blow up people. Now, this one's going to get a little tough, and I'm going to butt heads with a few of my friends in the five-sided building on this one. But the fact that we have to have military in space, or there is military in space on both sides, it's not their fault. That's a failure of politicians in, in all the different countries involved. It also means... You don't go dropping used space stations on people. I've been there. I've done that. No. Push it up. Recycle it. Sell it as scrap. Whatever. 
ISS shall not fall. So long as in so doing they do not harm nor interfere with any other human being or their property. This one we've already got through. This is the rights of non-interference that were passed in the legislation here in Congress and that we're seeing in Luxembourg and UAE and some of the other countries. Rights of non-interference. All right, that mainly, this is the, this is the low-hanging fruit. This comes from the law of this, laws, one of the laws of the sea. The idea, I'll give you the quick analogy, is if I'm in the ocean and I'm in a boat and there's a school of fish under me, I don't own the fish. I drop a net around it, I still don't own the fish. When I'm pulling the fish up to my boat, I still don't own the fish. But once those fish are on my, the deck of my boat, I own the fish. Nowhere in that process have I presumed to own the ocean. That one we got. That one we've got. So long as they do not harm sacred or venerated places. I'm willing to go with that one. All right? The Apollo, the Apollo sites, the Lunakhod sites. It's going to be interesting with a friend of mine. He actually bought one of the Lunakhods from the Russians. But why not? Let's have some venerated sites. Let's have some places that we say, okay. I mean, the D.D. Harriman type thing of, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to see Coca-Cola's logo scraped out on the near side of the moon. That's just taste, though. So long as they do not harm the ecosystems of any other living creatures. You might remember the scene from Avatar, the death of the tree. The ecosystem. Now, I'm going to make a little side note argument. I am not a scientist, by the way. You can tell probably already. But let's say they have discovered that in some pools of water under the ice cap on Mars, they, that we end up, we discover that there's life in those pools of water. This is where lawyers are going to have a lot of fun. I would say that's an ecosystem, not Mars. Because if those creatures that are in that pool of water were exposed to Mars itself, they would be dead. They are within their own little ecosystem. So maybe we don't do that. We don't go dig around in that. Whatever. But I'm saying, I'm trying to be very specific in that. That we are not going to go bulldozing in on full-up ecosystems. What I call the prime directive. That's just me. Not everybody's going to agree with me with every part of this. Like I said, I'm a tree hugger. But if we can do this, I believe we can blow out of the cage. I really do. I put those clauses, those last three or four clauses in there, because what that does is rather than getting caught in a, I'm a freaking libertarian, you're not, didact, you know, argument based on pure philosophies, I've peeled away three or four groups there that would be in opposition to us and brought them into our side. That's how you do it. Because right now we are engaged in an act of, human cre of creation. I believe it is a human right to go anywhere to build new homes, to plant the seeds of new societies, and to be whoever you want. Hang out with whoever you want. If you're a Lakers fan and you want to hang out with the people in the Lakers fan space colony, great. You go do that. I believe we have a purpose, and this is the key. We. We have a purpose. I love speaking to kids, by the way, because I like them. I can zone in on them and go, you have a purpose. Just like everybody here in this room has a purpose. I'm asserting that. You may not believe it. This is my assertion to you. I assert this. I declare it. You can share with it, share in it with me. You don't have to believe it, but I do. That you have a purpose. To carry the light of life to places now dark. The seeds of, light, of life to places now dead. And the eyes, hands, and minds of humanity to places yet unseen, untouched, and unexplored. You have a purpose. We are here to go there.
Thank you. Where's my time going? We have five minutes for questions. Does anybody have any questions? Good, I'm out. There's a guy, a young person here. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a mic over here. You can mime your question. And, no, I'm kidding. Hey, so the, the one thing that concerns me is that, you know, it's, it's very aspirational in general, and of course that makes it very inspiring sounding, but, um, you know, a Bill of Rights is, is a legal document, not an inspirational document, if you, know, if you know what I mean. And specifics are kind of important. You know, if, if a nuclear power plant is my idea of a sacred space, does that mean that, you know, it's a violation of my human rights when environmental activists go on to it to, to you know, protest it and try and shut it down? I mean, that's kind of an important distinction to make, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Yeah, that's why you have the institutions of, uh, of government. That's why you have international relationships that have, have diplomats. Now, somebody's breaking into your territory to destroy something. That's one argument. Their argument is your nuclear power plant is killing their thing. Right? So now you've got a discussion. I'm not saying you go say screw you to everybody else. Right? That's, that's why we have language, the ability to gesture, and have the political uh, people who are expert in that. Um, speaking of a, a document, while you were. This is when I left out, but, um, you know, there's some precedents out there in the world that we can dig up for this stuff. Hi, um, yes, thank you for your talk. Um, sure. it's, it sounds like a really kind of good start and a statement of intent. I, I was um, really interested in your inclusion of um, you know, clauses uh, referring to sacred and venerated spaces. Um, I, I think that's... That's really important, but I, I also um, want to note that we're really bad at doing that on Earth right now, currently, yep. uh, especially when it comes to places sacred to indigenous peoples. So um, I, I guess what, what work do you think needs doing um, now today in order to make a sort of aspirational -like goal like this something that people will buy into and actually commit to following? Mm -hmm. um one of the tricks of history that I believe in is that over the arc of history, we actually try to get better. And going into a new domain that is so new, at a time in history, for the first time in history, where we are able to, in a more universal cultural way, examine our past, Examine what we've done right. Examine what we've done wrong. Using history, archaeology, all the different things we can apply to understand how we got to this point. That if we can apply that learning, that knowledge, to the creation of new societies in an enlightened way, then we can move to the next level. You know, people ask me, well, why should we go into space? We have so many problems down here. My answer is exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because that's how we change down here. Without an edge, the center comes apart or crushes itself. We have to have that edge. That's where the new idea is. What is the next step beyond democracy? One of the other beautiful things about this is hopefully we're not taking this from anybody. You know, I think of the right people. One of the things I'm thrilled about is when I look at the people outside of the aerospace industrial complex, although many of the employees of that, but the, the ones that are not motivated by that, but the, the Jeffs, the Elons, the, the, my fellow nerds and geeks in the space startup community, et cetera, there is a, a feeling of humanity among these people. They really are, maybe personally they're assholes, but in reality, they're, they're dream, the way they work with the world. I mean, look at Elon, right? He's got a solar company. He's, you know, electric cars. He's doing this. You know, look at, at Jeff. Look at some of these other people. They're trying to do the right things. That's a little bit different than, you know, the, the robber barons of, of other eras. Oh, by the way, they're going to show up. 
which many of us are going to take as a sign of success when people show up just because there's money to be made. But we should try and imbue what we do with some sort of ethical approach. I'm absolutely for that. I don't want to bulldoze the universe. You know, I want to dance with it. What if I'm dying of hunger and they are good to eat? Who, where, who said that? <laughs> what did the voice come? Hold on, raise your hand. I can't. Where? Over there. God, that threw me off. <laughs> Sir. What if you're dying of hunger and they are good to eat? Well, first of all, if you've made it that far into space and you're dying of hunger, you've got a problem. <laughs> Darwin should have taken you out, okay? You should be able to grow your own food, create your own food, have your nanobots make your food for you, or have worked out a trade deal with those creatures so that you can barter for the food. Um, hopefully you don't reach sort of a Bear grills. you know, I'm going to have to, whatever, survival level in space when you're reaching them. Just my thought. One, Sir. one last one? Yeah. Sir, real quick, I work on ocean issues. Can you issues. raise your hand? I, I, I've got a light. I'd oh, stand okay. up, but I'm in my wheelchair. Oh, I'm so, so. sorry. <laughs> and that so I work on ocean issues, and I can tell you that the only way we're going to save life on this planet is by studying the heavens, because only then will people appreciate just how rare, how incredibly complex, and how sacred life is on this planet. So we have to, we really have to explore of the inner solar system so that that way people get a sense of perspective. One of the interesting things I love about what's about to happen, if we collectively succeed for whatever our rationales are, is that we become a living, interacting energy source of ideas and become the icon of what's possible for living creatures and communities to do with each other. In other words, if we're living in little, there, there is no better environmentalist than somebody that's living in a sealed tin can, looking down at the earth, drinking recycled air, and dr drinking their own recycled urine. This person is aware of ecosystem, okay? And becomes iconic. You wanna talk about family values. If you're living in a habitat, and you count on every other person in that habitat for your survival, and they count on yours. And if some idiot throws open the airlock, you all die. The kinds of social structures and integration, the kind of interdependencies, the kind of social lubricants, the kind of community building that you have to have to make that work is going to be an example that we sorely need down on this planet. And the fact that all those people are going to be of mixed colors and religions and races all working together is something we desperately need right now. And the fact that they are going to be doing that in the name of life, I think, is something that can give us all hope. Thanks.